Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning or good evening. We have a truly global audience today. So, so thank you for joining us for this first virtual LSE public lecture since the cancellation of the regular public lecture program earlier this year. Uh, and thank you for bearing with us as we also try to run this large event virtually. Well, LSE is exactly as empty as it looks on the image behind me. The last parts of the schools were closed last week and our students are scattered all over, but many of them back in their home countries. And of course, as you know, each country is in a different phase of the epidemic curve. I know that some of you are following this from wherever, wherever you are, just to reassure you that uh, we are thinking of you as, as, and as you know, you will, we are still teaching this week. Of course, it's all virtual, but it's, we are really trying our best to keep teaching going. This is the last week. And like other faculty, uh, I'm confined to my home and we are doing our best to make sure that we can continue to deliver to our students, but also to keep up with other obligations. And of course, the demand from policymakers is extremely strong right now. And we are all struggling to understand this virus and the impact it's having you know, on our lives and, and in different parts of the world. So this evolving crisis has forced us all to adjust and to improvise. It's just not possible to have this kind of policy seminar really discussing any policy issue at this time without relating it to the crisis. And that's what we are doing to do today. And that's what we are gonna do as we roll out our events over the next few months. Today, we want to look at the historical experience and see what we can learn for the current crisis. I will be very brief in my introduction to give us, our speakers enough time and allow for questions and answers. We have a very large number of people on today's call. And I ask you to mute your phones when you're not speaking. If you want to ask questions, you can raise your hand, uh, use the, the raise your hand function uh, on, in Zoom. And, and we'll try to do our best to, to keep track of that. Uh, when you ask a question, please introduce yourself and your affiliation. It helps um, to keep track for those who are, don't see you and, and are lis listening maybe later. So for today's events, we have asked Professor Harold James of Princeton University and one of the leading historians on economic and financial reconstruction to look at lessons from history for how to recover from deep shocks like the one that we are currently going through. We also asked LSE's own Professor Ethan Ilsetsky from the economics department who has worked on war economies and post-war reconstruction to give some comments. We are very grateful that they have both agreed to speak to us today. Errol, it's a great honor to have you back here at the LSE, not in person, but in spirit and in image and voice. It's the second best as so many things are these days, we are forced to accept uh, these things as we are adjusting to this current reality. But we're very much looking forward to your presentation. The virtual floor is yours, Harold. Well, thank you very much, uh, Eric. Uh, good afternoon to you in London. Um, good day everywhere in the world. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to be with you. I hope you're well and I hope you stay well. Um, we're at the moment uh, at a really turning point uh, in the in the uh, development of the corona crisis. Um, the infections are escalating in many countries, um, but we're hoping uh, that the social distancing applied is, is going to slow down the, the course of the epidemic. And um, the problem I think at the moment is that we have to think of a number of different time horizons at the same time. We're obviously desperately concerned uh, with how to manage this particular crisis. Um, but while we're managing the crisis, uh, we're also going to be more and more worried about what the world looks like uh, afterwards. And so it's, it's a question of, of balancing uh, those, those two perspectives of immediate crisis management and thinking of a long-term future. And that relationship is really extraordinarily difficult uh, to, to, to deal with. Um, uh, when we think about these issues, 
uh, I think it's inevitable whenever you're faced with something that's uh, uncertain and problematic, uh, you look for some kind of historical example. Um, and uh, th that's what I wanted to share with you um, over the, the next minute. Um, I'm going to try to share the screen now so that I can um, I can uh, sh show you uh, uh, s s some slides. Um, th th there are two kinds of analogies that are being um, made. Um, one is to do with past pandemics or uh, plagues. Um, the other is to do with wars. Um, there have been a number of uh, papers. Um, some of them have been written uh, over just over the last days, uh, over the last weeks, uh, on the lessons of the Black Death or the lessons of the um, so-called Spanish influenza or at the end of the First World War. Um, uh, so, so that's one way of thinking about it. Um, another way of thinking about it is the kind of mobilization that took place in wartime and particularly in the great conflicts of the 20th century in the First World War and the Second World War. And the, the kind of analogies to war are being more and more uh, frequently made. Um, so it's, it's a standby of any political speech. Um, Xi Jinping um, at the beginning of February talked about this as a people's war, um, but everywhere uh, you hear the same kind of statement, uh, the Prime Minister Boris Johnson, uh, we must act like a wartime government and do whatever it takes uh, to support our economy. Um, so uh, the, the question, if you think that you're really in a wartime setting um, is, this is a very different kind of war. Um, the, the enemy is not a, another country, um, it's not people, um, it's, it's invisible to the naked eye. Um, we're not really clear when we can see what victory or defeat is because it may well be that like the pandemics of the past, like the Black Death um, or like the Spanish influenza, that these will be recurring pandemics. Um, they may occur in more or less severe forms, but the uh, bubonic plague really continued to ravage Europe um, until the 18th century. Um, in the 18th century, there was a kind of protective mechanism that gave some kind of barrier against the uh, Black Death, the uh, militarized frontier between the Habsburg Empire and the, uh, the Ottoman Empire. Uh, really stopped the transmission, but the uh, the plague was still endemic in the Ottoman Empire um, into the 19th century. Um, so the, the enemy is going to be around for a long time. Another question I think is, uh, you know, this is an unprecedented test for international solidarity. Um, the impetus in any kind of crisis like this is to think that we can deal with this best in our own setting um, in the national setting. Um, sometimes we see it in the United States as well, uh, that it's actually the state governments rather than the federal government that are at the forefront uh, of the response. But you need to think of working with other countries. There are supply chains that are uh, cross-border, that are across the country, international, uh, the supply of medication and so on is international. And above all, I think, and that's what I wanted to focus on really, is the question of the relationship between short-term measures and longer-term um, planning for a post-war period. So plagues involve a severe demographic loss, um, um, much, much heavier than any calculation of what the likely uh, number of victims will be from the current uh, virus. The, um, Black Death in Europe reduced the population by about a third. Um, that's still true uh, when the plague is coming back in the 17th century. Um, uh, they had a severe long-term impact. Um, uh, I think the current understanding is that the decline of Italy in the 17th century is in large measure a consequence of the, um, of the, of the uh, plague epidemics in the first part of the century. And um, the long-term rate of return on capital is, uh, is depressed. 
Um, wars, on the other hand, are characterized by the destruction of capital goods. But there's often a really quite strong um, recovery afterwards. Um, so I'm going to think first of all of the immediate response, and then I'm going to think about the post-war order uh, and, and try to integrate those at the end. Um, so first of all, the immediate response, a uh, wartime episode uh, requires an unprecedented kind of mobilization. Um, a central direction of resources, um, and you can think very clearly, I, I believe, uh, in the kind of analogies, uh, and it's, it's actually discussed in the United States particularly um, as using the 1950 Defense Production Act uh, to set priorities and allocations uh, to expand the productive capacity and supply. And uh, the 1950 Act allows for a reorganization uh, of industry in order to get the supply uh, going. So uh, that's thinking about the development of what, what the hospitals need at the moment, um, personal protective equipment, disinfection material, diagnostic testing, uh, testing for antibodies, um, uh, quite soon, uh, perhaps antiviral drugs. Um, uh, but, but, but this involves uh, factories that were doing other things making ventilators now, um, making face masks in clothing uh, factories. Um, uh, so it can be done by some kind of voluntary coordination, uh, but it's likely to be done um, in a centrally coordinated way. Um, and th that's exactly the wartime analogy. Um, so I think this is, this is widely known, um, but there are other features of a wartime mobilization that I think are only beginning to creep into the consciousness as we discuss the uh, response to the coronavirus. Um, that is that it, it is particularly clear in the Second World War, in part that was a lesson from the First World War, uh, that civilian morale is enormously important. It's a critical part of the war economy. And um, you, you can lose the war on the home front as well as on the battlefield. Um, and there was a, a kind of belief in many countries that the decisive measures in the First World War had actually been concerned with the degree of effectiveness of domestic mobilization. So uh, th that was a case of supplying um, food to people, um, but also to supplying food in a way that looked as if it was equitable. Um, you didn't want to see uh, the rich living a life of extravagance, consumption and luxury uh, when other people were, were, were short of, of, of food. And the rationing systems that were designed in the Second World War were designed in part to alleviate the first problem of inadequate supply, but also to deal with the second problem about the perception of injustice. And uh, we're seeing exactly that kind of issue emerge at the moment. Uh, when you look at the, uh, this is just grabbed from a, um, a, uh, a, an online newspaper, um, the discussion about hoarding at the beginning of the coronavirus and then throwing away large quantities of food because they'd spoiled as a result of excessive hoarding, um, this is exactly what's pushing uh, that kind of discussion. And you can see that that was, that was done. Uh, it was hoarding uh, at the beginning of the, the war and uh, there was a worry that some people were doing better than others. Some people were getting away with things. Uh, so uh, there's a question of, of, of rationing, um, providing uh, fair shares. Um, uh, so th th this is something that uh, I think you, you may well find as the lockdowns in different countries uh, go into uh, several weeks, months, um, uh, that, that that's exactly where the problem uh, will appear. 
and uh, th th there will be a, 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 a really sense that some people get the access to the resources other people don't um, and it may be that uh, a, a effective policy response requires a guarantee uh, that people will have access to goods but people will also be able to afford them because one of the features I think that we, we see very very dramatically is that there are some people uh, who are getting salaries that are continued to be paid. There are some people on official short-term working schemes, um, but there are some people who had casual employment before who are actually really desperate um, and uh, are running out of money. Um, th th that's something that needs to be dealt with um, and the, the response needs to be quite, quite quick and quite effective. Um, a third feature of uh, the wartime story is the, the story of the mobilization of people. Um, uh, we have that today in the, in the uh, modern analogy. Um, there's a front of nurses and doctors, hospital staff, but there's also everybody involved in supply chains, um, in the maintenance of public order. Um, and we can see in some areas where there, there has been uh, already a, a long habituation with the problem of the, uh, the virus and infections, the, the breakdown of public order. This is a, a screenshot uh, from a riot in Wuhan at the end of March. Um, but uh, the, the, the question of whether public order can be maintained uh, through, through an extended uh, pandemic um, is clearly going to be, as we get into more and more into the emergency, uh, something that we think uh, more about. And then um, finally, uh, and uh, Ethan has thought a lot about this as well, um, there are the fiscal and monetary consequences of this. Um, and that I think is probably where the idea of the wartime response uh, was shaped very quickly. Um, that uh, there's been a, a big fiscal response um, across the major industrial economies. Um, emerging markets are doing the same kind of thing. Um, and uh, th th there's almost a worldwide pattern, which is a fiscal stimulus, um, but then absorbing it uh, on the balance sheet of central banks. Uh, this is the uh, additional spending um, uh, in, in, in the UK, uh, you can see uh, of, at the moment uh, of the fiscal responses, the response in the US looks as if it's the largest in, proportional, uh, in proportion to GDP. Um, and the president is just talking about doubling uh, that fiscal response uh, at the moment. Um, uh, it will be taken onto the, largely onto the balance sheet of uh, central banks. Um, and that is immediately reminiscent of the, uh, the wartime um, mobilizations. The central bank balance sheets are already uh, very extended in the aftermath of the financial crisis. This is the ECB balance sheet with the promise of taking on more. Um, and a few days ago, uh, you saw, I think, a really quite dramatic uh, op-ed piece uh, by Mario Draghi in the Financial Times, uh, where Draghi looked into the future and thought about how much higher public debt levels will become a permanent feature of our economies and will be accompanied, uh, he said, by private debt cancellation. And looking at the, uh, at the past, he, he then uh, said, uh, during the First World War in Italy and Germany, um, uh, between six and eight percent of war spending in real terms was financed uh, from taxes. Um, I'm not sure about those those figures. Um, those figures are still the subject of intense discussion, um, but it it is certainly the case that only a very very small proportion of the wartime expenditure um, in both world wars, uh, but particularly in the first world war. Uh, the Second World War was better at doing this. It was a, uh, in part a question of drawing lessons from the First World War. Um, uh, it was much less financed um, uh, from, from uh, taxes. 
Um, so, so those the, 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 those are uh, other calculations about the expenditure from the budget. Um, but you can see, I think, how as the war goes on, um, the deficits um, mount um, deficits as a share of expenditure um, in the United Kingdom and France, Germany. Um, Germany, by the last year of the war, over 90% um, is uh, financed directly. Uh, through the printing press, um, uh, it's it's less in the United States. It's less in the United Kingdom, um, and it has everywhere inflationary consequences. So, um, over the past uh, decade, one of the big policy dilemmas has been how to restart some kind of level of inflation in order to get out of deflation. Um, the wartime financing and the massive taking of public debt onto the balance sheet of central banks um, uh, has an inflationary impact. Um, and it's, it's difficult to see how that inflationary impact uh, is, is, is going to be avoided. Um, that's what I want to deal with right at the end of the presentation. So let, let me think uh, in the second part of the presentation about a longer term vision. Um, first of all, what happens to supply chains? Um, we are in a globalized world, we were in a globalized world, um, but in the course of responding to the crisis, there has been a big demand uh, to have medical supplies, pharmaceuticals, more accessible locally and to be less dependent on the apparent benevolence or uh, possibly politically motivated uh, donations uh, from other countries. At the moment, for instance, there's a, a struggle about whether the Europeans uh, should accept face masks that are made in uh, Taiwan. Um, we're, we're, we're seeing um, a, in a really graphic way, uh, the way in which the, the world pharmaceutical supply chains are basically dependent uh, on China. Um, uh, most generics, uh, when they're imported, are imported from India, but they depend on supplies that are also coming uh, from China. Um, is that going to end as a result of the, the epidemic? Um, is everybody going to say that they need to ensure that they can supply themselves? It's hardly feasible to th even think that. It may just be possible for a large country, the United States or a large middle-sized country, the United Kingdom uh, or France or Germany or Italy uh, to make those kind of supplies. But if you think about Latvia or Slovenia, producing a full range of antibiotics, uh, it's absolutely uh, an incredible thought. So th 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 that's, that's not going to happen. Um, uh, so thinking about the longer term future, uh, we're going to have to learn lessons uh, from this, this particular episode of how to really integrate uh, a secure supply chain uh, so that we don't get shortages and we don't get questions about how scarce resources are allocated and which country is favored or which area of the country is favored uh, in the moment of an emergency. A, a, a second uh, longer term uh, feature, I think, uh, is that um, although we're all allies in this, uh, and, and, and countries need to work together in order to fight the coronavirus, there's also a sense in which they're rivals. Um, and the crisis is going to be remembered and it's going to pre be presented in a very simple visual way. Um, so all of you who have thought about the European debt crisis, uh, over the last uh, 10 years, uh, will know that there's a chart that everybody shows about the European debt crisis that shows the spread of government bonds. That's the way in which you see 
uh, where governments are. Um, the competition in this particular case is to get the less steep curve uh, for the uh, rising rates of infection and uh, the rising rates of mortality. And if you look at this at the moment, that you can see that South Korea and Japan look as if they're the unambiguous winners of this. And the United States, uh, the UK, uh, France and Spain um, it look more vulnerable. Um, people are going to make judgments, in other words, about the extent of the effectiveness of the public policy response. They're going to use curves like this to evaluate the response of governments as a whole. It's not just the health system, but it's the way in which information is used. That's a key to the way in which South Korea handled the crisis. Um, and the discussion of this, I believe, will be to push countries to be more like the successful cases, to be more like South Korea, and less like the unsuccessful cases. Um, we're going to face also big questions about particular industries. Uh, I just thought of one which is particularly obvious and it's at the center of the discussion of the crisis response in the United States, uh, the future of uh, the transport and aviation industry. Um, it's unlikely that there will be a recovery very soon. Um, transport may be completely shut down for some time, um, but when it re recovers, it will recover in the end, but it is unlikely to be on the scale uh, that it was uh, before. Um, and the question is, how do you plan that? Uh, that was a question that arose uh, in, the, in the wartime mobilizations of the 20th century. Um, it was a very obvious question. How's the world going to be connected uh, after the war? What's civil aviation going to do? Um, and the answers that were provided at that time were really spectacularly wrong-headed. Um, and uh, th th there's, there's a really famous uh, version of this um, is the, 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 the Brabazon uh, um, committee um, created during the war to design a future plane to think about uh, the needs of aviation uh, in the British Empire, the British Commonwealth, um, and came out with this. Uh, this is a prototype that was built in 1950. Uh, it's a really beautiful aircraft. It's uh, about the size of the Airbus 300, uh, spectacularly bigger than anything, but absolutely uneconomic. And um, the the story of the Brabazon, um, I, I think, brings home one very clear lesson, uh, which is that governments are very, very central in mobilizing for the war, uh, but can be very poor in terms of thinking about the post-war future. Uh, so this was technically uh, great, uh, but commercially uh, absolutely unviable. And so in terms of thinking about the future, uh, you need to think of a system uh, that allows a whole range of initiatives. In other words, something like a market economy to function. Um, it, it's much better than the kind of planning system that's adopted uh, for the immediate necessities of the war. And finally, um, post-war monetary and fiscal management. Um, in this case, uh, absolutely at the center of policy, it uh, becomes the question of the management of government debt um, and consequently of interest rate policies. Um, you can think of alternative strategies being used uh, to do what Mario Draghi was suggesting, uh, you, you, getting rid of the high levels of debt after the war. It can be done by high levels of inflation, uh, but that if you think of the legacy of the First World War, was a recipe for disaster in Central Europe. Um, the hyperinflations of the early 1920s in Austria, Hungary, Germany, were an important part of the political destabilization of those countries. In the first instance, 
they look like an act of political stabilization, but it's another instance where something that looks as if it's holding you together in the short term, in the long run, um, is uh, deeply undermining. Um, alternatively, uh, debt cancellations or capital levies, charges on bank accounts, it's already been done in some countries in the response to the uh, coronavirus. Um, Russia has introduced a capital levy. Um, so those are, those are the alternatives. Um, but we have to think also um, that this is in, in the world of the 21st century. Um, and it's, it's clearly also a lesson of the global financial crisis is that it's not just public debt that is a problem, uh, but large amounts of corporate debt uh, can be equally a problem. And we're going to see uh, that problem of large scale corporate debt um, and the challenges that that poses in big emerging market economies in China. Uh, it's in China where uh, in this comparison, uh, the growth of non-financial corporate debt um, has, has been really high. Um, and um, characteristically, when, when large scale private debt becomes a problem, um, you often get a too big to fail discussion and then a question of taking it onto the public balance sheet and you expand the level of public debt uh, as, as a consequence there too. So um, uh, the, 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 the question of whether this is sustainable or not uh, depends absolutely on the interest rate policy. And that, that was at the heart of uh, the fiscal management um, in the aftermath of both world wars um, with rather different solutions. Um, the uh, First World War in Britain and the United States, um, big expansion of uh, government debt um, taken onto the balance sheet of banks, of the central banks. Um, uh, the Federal Reserve really found its role in 1917 uh, it had just been created a few years earlier in 1914. It, it finds its role uh, in buying government debt and it, it deals then uh, with uh, federal bills. Um, so what, what kind of solution uh, do you have there? Um, in the aftermath of the First World War, uh, both Britain and the United States tried to return to normalcy uh, very quickly with the dramatic post-war uh, deflation. After the Second World War, the sense of learning from the First World War episode was that you don't want to do that again. Um, and so the uh, erosion of the post-war debt uh, takes place over a much longer time frame um, uh, through a combination of economic growth um, and the tolerance of a higher level of, inf of inflation, but not the kind of hyperinflations uh, that Central Europe had had in the First World War. Um, so you can see this in, in uh, the United States case um, really quite dramatically how inflation shoots up in the aftermath of the First World War, um, but is then radically, radically reduced in the early 1920s. And it coincides with a dramatic industrial uh, contraction, um, a, a really short, severe slump um, in 1920, 1921, um, a contraction that's quicker than the contraction a decade later in the Great Depression. Um, thinking in terms of longer term perspectives, uh, then I think that contrast to the First and Second World War experience uh, shows you something that is important. It's important to operate uh, on, not just on government debt, on the numerator, but it's also important to think about what can provide economic growth. And um, the war stimulated all kinds of economic development, technical development, new working practices, um, 
pharmaceutical innovations, the spread of penicillin, for instance, is a consequence of uh, the uh, preparations in the Second World War for dealing with infections. Um, and we might also think, if we want to draw contemporary analogies, about the way in which um, the emergency of the coronavirus will introduce productivity enhancing mechanisms, better ways of working together. Um, the kind of discussion that we're having at the moment is an instance of that. Um, but thinking also of getting more effective medical systems, uh, it's making telemedicine much more important. Uh, that's, that's a tremendously helpful uh, development. Um, so we're likely to see some kinds of transformation. And if we, if we want to be optimistic, uh, and we think of where we can, we can get uh, more, uh, more productivity, um, more effective uh, development. It's exactly in terms of learning from the successful cases. And you know, the, the, the thought there is look at the kind of data management that Korea does, um, look at the kind of medical management. Um, uh, if you do this, uh, you may have a growing economy that makes it possible to sustain higher levels of debt uh, more easily without the dramatic pain and the discussion of who wins, who loses, which is absolutely characteristic of any kind of post-war uh, discussion. Um, who's going to pay for the war? Um, uh, that, that, that's, that's an issue that can be poisonous. Um, and the only way of diffusing the poison of, uh, of that kind of discussion is to get a, a higher level of growth. And so you really need to think uh, concretely of what you can learn uh, from this crisis in terms of, of, of getting effective um, and uh, dynamic uh, innovation. So th th those are some preliminary remarks. And I think um, uh, Ethan is going to respond a little bit, um, but the, 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 there's obviously a big room for discussion there. And thank you so much, uh, Eric. Thank you, Ethan. And thank you. Thank you so much, Harold. It was very thoughtful and, and um, inspiring for, for our discussion. Ethan, the floor is yours. Hey, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me and thank you for, uh, uh, thank you, um, Harold, for your uh, uh, comments. Um, you, you leave me in a very uh, unenviable position to try to uh, follow up on a very comprehensive uh, um, uh, discussion of, um, of the current situation and the analogies from uh, uh, previous uh, historical episodes. Um, so, you know, I, I'd like to make my discussion relatively short to leave uh, room for uh, a broader discussion. And so I'll, I'll pick up on two, uh, on two issues that Harold raised. And, you know, in, in a, for, for the most part, I, I agree with everything that was said here, but I'll just sort of uh, um, uh, expand perhaps on a couple of these, of these issues, um, if I can get these. And, and you, you see the slides, do you? Um, yes. Okay, um, so the, the, the first question is, you know, I, I uh, as, as Harold pointed out, we entered into this crisis where, um, you know, many, many, I, I'm sure many of the uh, viewers uh, today um, have no experience with high inflation in their lifetimes, um, uh, where we have both, you know, successful, so successfully tackled the problem of inflation that um, we, uh, you know, we, we were worried about deflation and an inability of central banks to, um, to uh, restore inflation to, to targets. Um, so uh, there, there, an interesting uh, uh, feature of the current crisis is that we have um, mass unemployment alongside pockets of the economy that are clearly overheating. And so I, I quite agree with Harold that there is potential here to, to exit this episode with uh, high rates of inflation. Um, so I, I you know, looked at the data this morning and um, uh, so far I'd say uh, the, the inflation threat seems very limited. So you know, there's a lot of talk about uh, the pasta shortage here in, uh, in the UK and uh, uh, the supermarkets seem to uh, show uh, empty um, empty shelves, but if you look at uh, uh, wheat prices or other commodity prices, yes, they have increased quite a bit, but 
you know, not to, not yet to unusual levels. And so, um, you know, perhaps it will get just, uh, just pregnant enough with inflation um, from this episode to uh, deal with the, the previous deflationary uh, situations rather than enter into a hyperinflationary world. I am more concerned, you know, and, and uh, I, I won't say much about this, but I think there is uh, an enorm, you know, a, a room for a whole other uh, uh, conference on the topic of how emerging markets and developing countries will 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 um, will cope with this crisis. And there, I do see potential for hyperinflationary spirals in, in a few areas of the world. So I, I think. For the most part, we probably we may be at the end of the the long uh, non-inflationary global uh, period. Um, Harold also pointed out in the case in which debts were um, effectively repudiated repudiated uh, in previous wars, and you know this is from uh, work by um, uh, Reinhard and Srebrenica, um, who showed that you know much of the World War II deaths were, um, were decreased after the war, but a lot of this happened through, and this is a figure of financial repression with interest rates that were um, low, uh, um, real interest rates that were low or negative. And so there was sort of an effective repudiation of debt in the post-war period. Um, uh, and, you know, uh, uh, and I think the issue is, to come to the next slide, this shows sort of the distribution of real interest rates in this period of, of debt repudiation. That's the blue line. And we do see a lot of countries that had negative real interest rates. But this is the this green line here is how we entered the this current crisis. So we were already in a period with quantitative easing, with very low nominal interest rates, with low real interest rates, where effectively um, governments were being paid to borrow from the from the public, um, and so uh, you know this was already the status quo ante, and uh, one can only imagine uh, with the expansionary monetary policies that we've seen uh, currently um, that this uh, this will be a major part of how the debt is uh, is uh, uh, repaid. Now, a word of optimism on this is if we go back to this period of, um, of uh, uh, um, you know, of, uh, of financial repression. In many other respects, this is a, a period that was uh, extremely good uh, economically. I mean, economic growth and productivity growth were extremely high. You know, this was a period of growth for middle classes in, uh, you know, in uh, North America and Europe uh, and Japan. Um, uh, in, in some sense, this is a period that uh, many are many have expressed nostalgia to in terms of the economic, the global, or at least sort of the uh, high income country uh, economic uh, performance. So, you know, perhaps it is possible to do some partial repudiation on debt, not in the model of the interwar period, but in the model of the postwar period that coincides not with a Great Depression, but with uh, a period of, of high growth. So that's kind of one point on inflation and debt that I wanted to raise. And then um, I wanted to pick up on the um, innovation uh, and specifically um, Harold mentioned the aviation industry. And, and indeed, if you, um, if you, uh, uh, you know, look at the aviation industry uh, in the interwar, the pre-Second World War period, you know, this uh, picture on the left here, uh, it was sort of a hobby for rich people. It was not really... Uh, of much commercial use, except in uh, airmail, uh, you know, that, that in the airmail industry began to appear in the interwar uh, period, but you don't hear about people, you know, flying on vacation. Uh, if you look at the post-war period, you know, the, uh, my casual observation is that the uh, typical movie of the American movie of the 1950s is uh, Americans having a lot of fun in, uh, uh, on the uh, French Riviera or in Italy. And uh, you know this is still kind of a little bit of a rich person's game at this point, but nevertheless, you know we exited the Second World War with a very active commercial aviation uh, industry. The example that Harold g uh, gave, not with, uh, notwithstanding, and and this really was an artifact of enormous government investment in this in this industry. My question really here is, you know, if there is an analogy to our current period in the sense of, you know, 
is there are any of the medical equipment or you know medical advances uh, that will come out uh, certainly from this uh, period of public investment uh, will they have the same scale of commercial uh, potential and as Harold pointed out it's very important you know after the initial public investment to let the free market uh, do its its job um, uh, in in kind of unleashing the the, the creativity. Uh, of that of that industry, um, so I, I'll do a little bit of uh, of um, uh, shameless uh, advertising of my of of some work I, I am currently working on. Uh, this is um, you know research I'm doing on the aviation industry in the Second World War in the United States, and without getting into a lot of detail, this kind of relies on a natural experiment of the United States moving uh, production of aircraft uh, across regions in the U.S. Uh, due to fears of, of aerial bombing on the coasts. Uh, and so, so it uses that as a sort of natural experiment to see what additional government expenditure on aircraft um, uh, does to the productivity of aircraft uh, companies. And what we see here is the response to a 1%, and these are months on the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, x-axis, um, uh, the response of total factor productivity to a 1% increase in government purchases of airplanes at a specific, on a specific production line. So this is you know, very granular information. And what we see that you know, total factor productivity, and you can go on, this is quite persistent, um, increases quite rapidly. Uh, so productivity increases quite rapidly to respond to government demand uh, for, for new products. Um, and this is not even talking about innovation uh, across products, so, so creating new products. But this is kind of within product line, uh, you know, almost 50% of the government demand for aircraft in the United States was met by productivity enhancements during this period. So I very much agree with Harold's, uh, the, 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 um, uh, Harold's point that, you know, this, uh, this uh, tragedy could be the mother of, uh, of, of uh, innovation uh, um, uh, in, in similar uh, productivity enhancing uh, ways. Finally, on a slightly perhaps less optimistic note, uh, also work that I have um, in progress um, with my student Hugo Reichardt, um, is uh, the, the makeshift ventilator factories that we're now uh, seeing emerging. Now, I, I don't know enough about the ventilator industry to know if there are analogies from aircraft production to uh, ventilator production, um, but what I would say as a word of caution is that in the Second World War, despite very good PR by the auto industry that they contributed a lot to the war effort, they actually were extremely, extremely slow in responding. And you know, there's a lot of historical documentation of all the failures uh, of the auto industry to actually live up to the promises they made early in the war in producing motors and uh, air, uh, for the aircraft industry and and complete aircraft. So, you know, the, the famous American tale is about Ford Willow Run, but we forget that at the time, uh, the joke was that this is Ford Will It Run, um, because they didn't really believe that Ford would be able to come to this. And, you know, what we see here is that uh, in blue, we see the aircraft manufacturer's production of B-24 bombers. And here we see Willow Run did eventually produce quite a lot, actually, you know, close to 50% at peak. Uh, of the aircraft of this specific type. But here in the red line is when the Willow Run factory was first established. Um, here in the, the next red line is when Willow Run first started producing aircraft. And you'll see that it's even from that point, it's another two years almost until uh, the US government actually received any aircraft from this uh, auto manufacturer. So it looks like the time to convert a auto manufacturer to an aircraft manufacturer is along the lines of three years. And, you know, I, I, again, I don't know the technologies well enough to, to comment on this, um, but uh, the, the, the an analogy is obvious that we are kind of asking um, a, a lot of corporations that aren't really specialized in ventilator making to do this. Um, you know, the, the strategy during the Second World War that was much more successful was simply to give far more resources to those, um, those, uh, uh, um, those uh, 
corporations, those plants that already had the human capital in place to produce the products that we, we needed. So uh, a word of caution on, uh, you know, um, uh, on uh, Hoover makers uh, uh, producing uh, uh, ventilators. Thank you, Ethan. That was, uh, that was excellent compliment to Harold's um, presentation. Should we, I, I'll try now to take questions and, and uh, as I said, if you could introduce yourself um, and your affiliation uh, when you speak. Also, for those who don't speak, please mute your uh, mics. Um, so, do we have any questions? Uh, I have a question from uh, uh, Christine Cho. Is Christine Cho on? You are muted. You have to unmute. Yes. Can Great. you hear me now? So now we can hear you. Wonderful. I have unmuted. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Now you mute. My name is Christine Chow. Um, I am um, of 20. Huh? You go ahead. Is this working now? Yep. Great. Um, I am a, uh, on, in, in the court of uh, governors of the LSE, I've also had 24 years of experience in investment management. My question is here. The, the first question is related to, I think that, um, what is, we, we haven't included in the conversation so far is a very, uh, is a new factor that, um, that influence how the society responds to government, but also vice versa is uh, the big T, as in what is the technology impact um, to, the, to the crisis? Because increasingly we're seeing that technology obviously allows information to be dis um, disseminated more easily. But at the same time, we see technology to, to trace people and, and in, in some markets they are color coding those who are safe and not safe. And initially, we've seen that happening in China, which is more acceptable to the society. But a couple of years, days ago, um, it also appears in the BBC that the UK government is considering that as well. So um, my question is, um, besides the economic impact or likely economic impact um, that might, we might see as a result of this crisis, what might be the impact on the role of the state um, and also the um, perception of data privacy, which has been um, they're going very well, driving by, by, the, by the EU, and now maybe because of um, public health security, that data privacy um, expectations would need to be curtailed. And what is your expectation of this development? Thank you. So let me uh, take one more question while you reflect on this one from uh, Yuri Kazakov. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Hi, good morning. Uh, thank you very much to both presenters. I'm uh, from New York. I'm a graduate student at the History Department at Columbia University. And uh, <clears throat> my question is that uh, both of the speakers mentioned the aviation industry as a post-war economic restructuring example. And uh, my question along that line is, would we see increased dominance of large internet providers like Amazon uh, not because of a specific industrial policy, uh, perhaps, but because of its already large pre-crisis role in the starvation of many small businesses during this lockdown. And on a related note, will we move to a sort of a work from home economy as it becomes apparent that many service occupations can be done remotely via Zoom? Thank you very much. Thank you, Yuri. Uh, our own Piroska Noj Mohachi, please, Piroska. And, and thank you, Harold and Ethan, for the outstanding uh, presentations. Um, my first question would be the outlook for populism. On the one hand, one would have hoped that expertise, expert advice will gain much more currency in the current context, and, and populists not relying on those would fall. But on the other hand, we see uh, countries such as my original own Hungary, uh, where populist leaders really take advantage. Um, of the situation and, 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 uh, and introduced additional um, restrictive powers. So 
So how you see Aro, the, the outlook, um, what is the balance that is being drawn here? And second, if I may, Eric, if there's time, sort of how you see uh, how global institution, the whole globalization process will be, uh, will be emerging uh, from this crisis. Uh, Second World War gave birth to the Bretton Woods institutions. Do you see something uh, sort of, something fundamentally new potentially emerging uh, as well this time around? Thank you. Okay, you have uh, four quite uh, different questions. But, uh, maybe you can select a couple of them and, and, and comment and, and then Hiro, you yes. start and then Ethan covers up for you. Yes, I, th th thank you so much. Um, I, I mean, actually, actually, four uh, just terrific questions. Um, very, very central questions. Um, excuse me, could, could, if you're not speaking, could you mute the microphone? It's coming uh, in a rather loud form to me. And thank you. Um, uh, the, the, the first question, um, uh, Dr. Cho's question, I think is, is, is really fundamental. Um, uh, in that um, th those advances in medical technology that I was thinking of, they do depend on sacrificing some measure of privacy. Um, so I, I think, for instance, um, how medicine is likely to develop, uh, telemedicine, um, having uh, diagnostics that are linked to my, my computer so that the computer will measure basic things, pulse rates, oxygen rates, uh, blood sugar levels, white platelet levels. You, you can think of what it will do. Um, and that, that information is useful um, only if it's aggregated and uh, if, 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 it, if, it, if it's used uh, to uh, rapidly identify, for instance, where future pandemics are emerging. Uh, if, if people are really hooked up in this way, uh, to uh, a centralized medical system, um, you will be able to identify very, very quickly where a future variant, for instance, of the, uh, uh, the, the uh, coronavirus uh, could uh, be starting to uh, operate. Um, and that's in part what I meant um, when I said uh, th th that that curve of how many fatalities there are overall, um, what the rate of infection is, how far the rate of infection is increasing. Uh, those will be used widely as a measure of the effectiveness of government responses. And uh, where information is widely shared, um, the government response is going to be, is, is going to indeed be more, more effective. And um, uh, so I, I, th I think that's a legitimate question uh, that w will be put to to voters, to politicians, um, in various countries, in in uh, in, in Europe. Um, uh, are you willing to maintain a level of data protection um, that makes you less effective in responding to this uh, this this kind of emergency? Um, at, at the moment, if we look at the world, uh, we we think of um, uh, China is being least concerned uh, with data protection um, and Europe being at the most concerned level. If it really turns out uh, that Europe has a poor response uh, to the coronavirus because of concerns over data protection, then I think uh, there will be a push to, uh, to, to modify that. Um, uh, the the um, the, the, the second question uh, from Mr. Kazakov, um, I, 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 I think, is, 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 is a good question. Um, you know, how far is it necessary that this is done by public agencies? Um, how far is a lot of the work in coordinating data uh, being done by uh, private uh, data providers, platforms, uh, corporations? Um, uh, you, you mentioned Amazon. Um, and uh, one of the consequences of the, uh, you know, even of what we've seen so far is, is that um, the pricing models of uh, those, th those big platforms uh, will be discussed. Um, so I, I don't know how 
intensively you've monitored the prices on Amazon, uh, but you can see the prices of some kind of basic commodities have really shot up. So you know, that was part of the discussion that Ethan had. You know, he looked at the at the world market prices for wheat. Uh, but if you look at the price for breakfast cereals on Amazon, um, some of them have really escalated because they're set by a simple algorithm. Um, whereas in the local store, uh, they're kept constant. Um, and at the moment, when we're thinking about the need for basic provision, um, I think there will be a, a sense that um, local stores have, have uh, behaved more transparently. Um, and uh, it, it will, I think, generate a push. And that's, again, a question of regulation. It's a very, very important question that's, uh, that's at the key of the agenda. Um, uh, how, how the pricing models of um, uh, internet uh, platforms and corporations are managed, and what are the algorithms behind them, um, and then that, 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 that would be an intense regulatory issue. And, and finally, um, the, the question of populism uh, and uh, the response, uh, Piroshka's question. Um, uh, you, you're seeing um, leaders who I think are thought of as populist uh, behaving in, uh, in, in some uh, rather peculiar ways. Um, so, you know, an extreme outlier, I think, uh, is uh, the, the, the case of Bolsonaro in Brazil. Um, uh, it looks as if the mismanagement there is, 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 is going to harm his political position. Um, and, uh, you know, in general, I, I would come back to the uh, the, the sense that this is a real test of the competence of governments and of administrative machineries. Uh, if you've spent a lot of time trying to dismantle governments and administrative machineries because you, you think that they're representative of a deep state, you're likely to get into trouble. And we've already seen there's a lot of this discussion in the United States because the CDC um, has effectively uh, been scaled back in the Trump administration. Um, the, that looks as if it's one of the one of the things that is providing for a weaker response than that could have been. Uh, the CDC was a really, really very effective institution, um, uh, but it's it's it, it's it's been scaled back. And so, um, it, when we think of this, um, you know, the, the the demand for governments that can provide competent responses. Um, is, 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 I think, fundamentally a very, very different kind of story than the demand for governments that can produce simple messages, which was the, the, the heart of the populist appeal. The, the populist appeal was trying to distill things down into a very simple message, protect the people. But if you can actually show, and you know, that's where, again, data is going to be very, very uh, sensitive because uh, you know, th these, these uh, questions of the rates of infection, the rates of mortality are intensely political questions. And so uh, the, 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 there's likely to be a lot of concealing and we already see the discussion, has China concealed uh, some of the, the mortality from, uh, from the coronavirus? I can't help uh, bringing up uh, Piroska's second question because uh, I mean, you are also the sort of official historian of the IMF. And of course, you talk now about competence at the level of national governments. But if you think about the global level, and it took a long time for the IMF after it was created to really play any meaningful role. How, and, and of course, out of the global financial crisis it came out kind of quite a lot stronger. Right now it has, I think, more than 85 official requests and, and a number of others coming probably. How do you think the IMF will come out of this? And, and well, I, I, I think indeed um, uh, the, the, the really is, is as I tr tried to lay out in the presentation, a, a need for the effective uh, monitoring of information on an international level, on a global level uh, as well. And uh, there's a, a, an absolute crisis demand. Uh, so two very, very different sorts of uh, demand on international institutions. Um, uh, but 
uh, we're, we're, we're going to be uh, living, I, I believe, still in, in a world in which um, goods come from one country to another country. Um, it, it's an important part of the international division of labor. Pharmaceuticals are made in one place. Uh, they need to be sold to other places, but countries need to be secure that they're not going to be cut off um, in, 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 a, in an emergency. Um, and uh, so maintaining an international trading system, um, maintaining an international open economy uh, is, 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 I think, a very, very important part of the crisis response and the post-crisis response. Ethan, do you want to add anything? No, um, so I, I, um, I don't have much to add. I'll just on, on Piroshka's question on the international order, I mean, um, the, the, uh, it uh, required, um, you know, it required a lot of uh, will among the world leadership and a very, very big shock of the Second World War to create the institutions. I mean, we saw the intra-war failure of that. And, you know, Roosevelt was a internationalist at heart and Pearl Harbor had killed essentially the isolationist movement in the United States. I don't really see yet, an, you know, in the United States, I don't really see yet an analogy to that. Um, uh, I'm going to ask another round of, or let another round of three questions in. So this first, Vicky Price, then Tim Besley, and then Oli Rain. Vicky. You're, yeah. Is it okay now? No. Oh, yeah? Yep. Oh, great. Uh, well, thank you very much for this. Uh, we saw the little uh, chart on productivity, but higher public sector doesn't necessarily, which we're going to have for a bit, doesn't necessarily mean higher productivity, of course. But what might lead to it is what was mentioned earlier by, by Harold as well, which is, uh, that uh, ways of working might change. Uh, the worry that I have is that given the disruption that's taken place, will firms start really applying considerably more IT, AI and so on, uh, which really will mean at the end that the increase in employment we saw after the Second World War, of course, isn't going to happen and we will have a permanently lower employment base because they will be substituted much faster than we all forecast uh, by machines in order to avoid the disruption that we've seen because of the pandemic. <clears throat> Thank you, Vicky. Tim? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, one small comment and then and then a question. The, the comment, uh, which I, I'd like <coughs> to hold, uh, maybe Ethan, but by the way, thanks for excellent presentations um, to comment on is, I, I think if you look at the my reading of history is that the wars had a huge impact on the operation of the state as much as they did on the private economy. A good example would be in the area of tax policy that indirect withholding of taxation from people's pay packets was largely a, a wartime convenience, which then of course persisted after the war ended and we routinely now comply with taxes that way. And I wonder in a world where governments, many governments, because of globalization, were already struggling to hold their tax bases together, another part of this might be, a, 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 will have to be inevitably a redoubled effort to look for alternative uh, and additional revenue sources for governments as they confront the reality of the debts they've incurred and figure out how to service those. So I don't know if you have, have a view on that. My question was really about though, um, in terms of historical studies. Um, when, when you look at the period over which governments were reacting within a war, nobody knew how long the war was going to go on in real time. So, so famously, people said the First World War will all be over by Christmas. Um, and uh, got, so presumably there's this kind of learning process that goes on through a period of war um, in which governments are gradually responding to events. And, and I think when we look at what's going on right now, we're going to see a lot of that. I mean, at the moment we're being told maybe in 12 weeks, maybe it's September, maybe it's December, maybe even it's a year, but we're gonna learn about that in real time and government responses are clearly going to have to change according to which of those time horizons 
And it's, of course, a lot of it is about managing the expectations of citizens, uh, because what we're being asked to do perhaps is more palatable if we think it's a three month endeavor than if we think it's a one year endeavor. Um, and I'd like to know, particularly from, from Harold's study of wartime economies, how did that play out and to what extent are the things that government could only do at certain points in the cycle, principally because people were beginning to become used to the fact that this was not going to be over by Christmas? Okay, Tim. Oli? Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, uh, many thanks. Uh, to Harold and Nathan for excellent, uh, very thoughtful presentations. Uh, my question uh, concerns uh, the experience and uh, scenery of uh, financial repression, financial repression with growth, uh, not uh, deflation. And uh, uh, now, if you look at uh, the post World War II period, uh, the Bretton Woods uh, international order consisted of uh, trade liberalization but restrictions on capital movements uh, with uh, fixed uh, but, but adjustable exchange rates, uh, as we know. And uh, this, uh, at that period, uh, seemed to have uh, facilitated uh, very strong recovery and uh, economic growth. So uh, what is your view? Could uh, the current uh, interport uh, such uh, kind of uh, recovery with uh, some sort of uh, financial repression. The central banks are, of course, doing whatever it takes, uh, but we are still in, uh, in the world of uh, uh, free capital movements, uh, for good reasons, uh, probably, uh, in the world of uh, central bank uh, independence uh, with uh, price stability mandates. Uh, so uh, what should uh, change uh, uh, in the international economic uh, order to facilitate, uh, say, a broader-based uh, post-pandemic uh, uh, economic uh, recovery. Thank you. Thank you, Oli. Uh, Harold, do you have another round of Yes. Um, well, in, in, in the order that the questions came, um, uh, so Vicky Price's question about um, uh, whether the the post-crisis environment is going to produce a surge of investment in machines that will displace uh, hu humans. Uh, so in effect, um, that's a kind of discussion that we've been having for the last 20 years already. Um, uh, is there likely to be a lot of uh, unemployment as a result of, of technology? Um, I think you're right uh, that certain processes are going to be um, uh, you know, m much uh, where it, 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 it's, it's uh, you know, the, the, there are clear benefits uh, to having machines rather than people. Um, so uh, you know, a lot of the things that nurses are doing in hospitals with with uh, you know. Ex exposing themselves to tremendous risks, it turns out, in the, in the middle of the, the virus. Um, uh, the, 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 that, I think, is one of the possibilities of the kind of telemedicine that I'm thinking of. Um, it gets replaced. Uh, supermarket checkouts, again, there's a lot of discussion about uh, the safety of supermarkets at the moment. Um, if you go over to the greater use of machines, um, does that eliminate risk and make it a safer place? Uh, I think it may do. Um, uh, so, you, you know, the push for safety is going to be one of the things that pushes in the in the direction of uh, using machines more uh, than people. Um, but but so far, I think the lesson has been that uh, there are always new activities that that develop um, and. Uh, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're often quite different, um, uh, but that if they're really genuinely productivity enhancing um, uh, investments, uh, what happens is then that there are more incomes available and more spending available for other things. And so, um, you know, exactly that I think is, is, is going to be at the, at the, at the center of the, of the optimistic vision um, uh, that I hope we have of um, how 
responding to a crisis gives us a moment uh, where we, we we can think about basic problems um, and uh, think how effectively all the all the knowledge and all the innovative capacity can really push you uh, to, uh, to 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 a, a, a better a solution. Um, uh, then. Um, uh, the, the the second uh, question for, from uh, uh, Jim, I think, um, uh, about the former colleague. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Of course, uh, I, I, I'm so sorry. I misheard. I didn't see the picture, so I, I couldn't I, I, I identify you. Uh, of course, of course. Um, uh, uh, nobody knows. Um, how long the emergency is going to last. That's, that's absolutely right. And um, you know, that's, that's, I think, one of the reasons why it's, it's, it's very important to, to, to think about what we do in the post-conflict uh, or post-virus environment, uh, why we're still in the middle of it. And um, if you think back, for instance, to the Bretton Woods story, um, the Bretton Woods Conference was in July 1944. Um, and that was a moment, it was just after the Normandy landings and where the Allied armies were moving across France very, very quickly. And uh, so there was a realistic thought in the summer of 1944 that the war in Europe, at least, might be over uh, by the end of the summer, or certainly by the end of the year. Um, and so it was really important to have the post-war order in place before you actually uh, stop the conflict. And th th I think that is a, a, a good um, historical lesson, um, that that kind of thinking worked much better than the terrible peace conference of 1919, uh, after the end of the conflict, uh, where all the factionalism and all the nationalism is really pulling apart. And it was much, much harder as a result uh, to get a stable and, and productive um, uh, peace settlement. Um, and, you know, I, th I think it's, it's, it's also uh, the case that uh, you can think of ways in which the kind of techniques that we need to respond to the crisis are also ones that are going to be of relevance afterwards. Uh, you know, medicine was one example, but, you know, another one, I think, is uh, the, the question of um, uh, uh, fintech. Um, you know, are, are we going to be much less dependent on conventional cash? Uh, that might be really a, a strong lesson of the crisis. If you're thinking about how to pay basic entitlements in order to get, I, I, I think I, I wanted to emphasize a little bit in the presentation how important it is that um, everybody has access uh, to resources and that people are not cut off from food uh, or from housing. Um, because of the loss of activity in the middle of the crisis. But if you think of the mechanisms that are needed to provide them with that kind of provision of resources, you know, what kind of electronic material would be put on uh, smartphones? What happens to people who don't have smartphones? Uh, how can they be brought in? Um, uh, the, 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 those are questions that are going to be uh, be relevant afterwards as well. So they, they, you know, both on the macro level of planning an international system that is still open to trade and on the micro level of what it takes to manage ordinary everyday life. Uh, I think uh, the, the, the crisis is, 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 uh, is, 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 is doing something. Um, and uh, Ollie Rain's uh, questions about the, um, you know, w w what is gonna happen to free capital movements, um, uh, I, I think if you if you imagine um, likely scenarios after the crisis of um, problems with private sector debt or pro problems with public sector debt, um, an immediate consequence of that is to is to try to limit um, capital movements. Um, that that that's part of the story of the European uh, crisis after 2010. Um, that there's a Kind of effective renationalization of uh, European markets, um, macroprudential uh, uh, regulation is also 
limiting capital movements. Um, it goes back to a question in the first round. Um, you know, also the, the question in this, this round about um, uh, taxation, uh, how, how do you manage it? Um, well, um, if it's really true that we're moving more in the direction of um, e-money and uh, uh, then um, that also is a more visible uh, kind of transaction uh, to, in, 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 in terms of the monitoring of the whole system. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's much less liable to evasion than, say, the cash economy is. Ethan, do you want to? Uh, yeah, I'll just jump in with a, uh, two uh, brief uh, comments. So uh, on, on, you know, uh, Ali Ren, uh, you know, asked about the post-crisis, uh, I guess, uh, monetary and uh, um, capital flow order. Um, you know, so uh, obviously I, I, I don't I don't know, and I hope that we will continue with uh, you know, uh, uh, or, or this will be an impetus, if anything, for more um, international uh, cooperation rather than uh, nationalism. But you know, the, the reason I began my my comments on the topic of inflation has to do with the point you made on this whatever it takes of the central banks, because. In you know March or April of 2020, it's a no-brainer for central banks to say, "We'll do whatever it takes and implicitly monetarily finance uh, budgets, etc." If you know, if we do see 10% inflation in the midst of you know 20% unemployment, which is not an impossible scenario half a year from now, then central banks' commitment to inflation stability will really be put to a test and. You know, I have to say that the whole inflation targeting experience was only really tested in a period where inflation, global inflationary pressures were extremely low um, for the past uh, 20, 30 years. Um, and I, I really wonder how central banks are going to truly, you know, when they really are, are made, are made to, to make these very hard decisions. Uh, what will they actually do? And I, I don't have an I don't have an answer to that, but I think that will be uh, something that I'm very uh, you know curious as to how it will go. And and just uh, a small comment on uh, on Tim on Tim uh, Tim's point. Well, I mean, uh, uh, Tim, you're uh, no one understands uh, fiscal capacity better than you. So uh, I, I would I would defer to you on on uh, uh, on that. Uh, uh, on that issue, but you know, I do wonder whether the tax side is the only side we should be looking at, in the sense that you know, in European governments have tax revenues to GDP that are you know many over fifty percent. You know, enforcing more taxes, I don't think there, there's so much scope there. But I do think we're we're going to demand. You know, perhaps we will demand more effectiveness of our government on the expenditure side, and of, of you know, really. Uh, understanding where the money goes and and that it's really being used in productive uh, ways. Okay, thank you. So I will have one more round at least. So I have uh, another colleague, Markus Brunemeyer. I have Khalid Abdullahi, and I have uh, Beata Yavorshi. Markus. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot for two excellent speeches by Harold and uh, Ethan. I have two quick questions. One is about, it came out, if I make it a little bit more black and white, the future is like uh, we have high inflation or we have financial depression. And I would like to get the more clear picture on that. You know, what does financial depression mean for the liberal order of capital flows, for international flows? And also, if it is uh, more financial depressions or not, is the big difference to we see the, the world split further apart it, apart between governments which can issue safe assets and which governments which can't. And, uh, you know, governments which can't issue safe assets, they have to live with high inflation and also a much smaller reaction to the budget. As we saw, Italy is spending only 1% of GDP, Germany is spending 4% of GDP uh, in order to fight the current events. And then I have a historical question. If you look back uh, in various crises, war versus uh, the plague and so forth, some really lead to a huge destruction of physical cap capital, and the other one mostly about human capital. Can we say something across that line that, uh, you know, if the destruction of human capital is much more severe than the destruction of physical capital, do we have any evidence which one yeah. leads to an outcome standard? Yeah. 
Thanks. Thank you. Very important question, of course, the second one. The uh, both, but the second one particularly. Uh, Khalid? Uh, thank you very much, Eric. Uh, excellent presentations. I, I'd like to change the perspective uh, for Harold from just talking about fine, uh, technicality of numbers to some realities that we have on the ground and how would it affect. I'm going to have two questions after this, make this quick uh, premise. Uh, post World War II, uh, we had one of the successes was the leadership at the time. Today, this is, of course, my, my perspective, my opinion, that we, have, we lack effective leadership. Well, or let me put it, we have an effective leadership deficit uh, across uh, sort of be it at country level or at other levels. We have it, and that, of course, it's enhanced due to the uh, technological advancements or there is real time now. You see any leader in any position is basically assessed on a real-time basis, which makes life more difficult for that particular leader. But that is one factor which is there with what's going on. Number two is basically what our human rights aspects for individuals. I mean, we look at post 9-11, certain rules were put in in the United States, which were for effective for that particular period, but we still that, those rules are still going on as of today. Plus what we see turning around is some, with all what's going on, the, what I would call uh, the liberal world, the democratic world, we, change, we see now a bit of autocratic aspect coming in with what's going on now, which is expected, but with that stay or go away. Now with those three things there, now as a historian, um, let me just make it simple. Globalization before the crisis, say it was at a zero level, uh, now looking at medium and long term, do you see it minus five being getting really bad, plus five be it actually getting in a good position. That's number one. And number two, what are the chances, if the chances were zero before the crisis of having a silly war between two, the two super um, economic powers, how much this crisis actually is gonna enhance or not the chances of a silly war happening between the two? Thank you. And uh, Beata? You have mentioned that we are fighting an invisible enemy, and yet many leaders or some leaders uh, talk about a Chinese virus. Um, will politicians be tempted to find an enemy, particularly politicians in whose countries are not dealing very successfully with the pandemics? And if so, what will be the consequences of that? Harold? So great. Um, so can I start with the last two questions because they're, they're really related. Um, uh, so the, the, the level of international conflict, the precariousness of it. Um, so if, if you go back uh, to the world of 1945, um, I, I'm not sure uh, that I quite agree with the point that Khalid made about the good leadership because um, you know, the story of 1945 is that uh, the two big democracies who were in, in, the, in, in the war, uh, Britain and the United States, um, uh, Britain uh, had a leader, a very effective, inspirational uh, person who really held, held the country together in the war, who was then voted out in an election, um, and President Roosevelt died. Um, so there was an inexperienced leader in the United States who had no knowledge of the development of the atomic program, um, a new leader in, in the UK, uh, there was Stalin in Russia, uh, increasingly paranoid. It was actually terrible leadership. Um, but uh, what had happened in 1944 uh, in, in, the, in the preparations was that a structure had been built up that was capable and resilient enough of uh, dealing even with with bad leaders, and um, you know that's that's in a way what we really need. Um, we need a system that is so resilient uh, that it can't be it can't be blown up by a temporary spat between uh, Xi and Trump. Um, and uh, you know that's 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 the hope of an institutional multilateral 
uh, world order. Uh, so uh, Beato is absolutely right. Uh, leaders are going to try to blame the crisis on somebody else. Uh, there's a discussion in Europe about whether the supplies are going properly from one country to another. There's the discussion that Beata mentioned about the, whether it's a Chinese virus or not. Uh, I mean, these are incredibly distracting and, uh, and, and uh, really unhelpful uh, d discussions. Um, so, you, you know, in, in, in part, I think part of the, uh, the, the the benefits of having a discussion like this is that one one can really focus on the the, the, the kind of longer term uh, aspects of it and what is needed uh, for stability and you know I think that's where uh, uh, Marcus's questions are fundamental. Uh, can all governments produce safe assets? Obviously, they can't. Um, the governments that can produce safe assets are in a better position. Um, uh, so. Uh, you, you know, again, this is a pre-crisis discussion. Marcus was at the center of that uh, uh, pre-crisis discussion. Um, you need to be able to have safe assets in order to be able to do the things that we expect public authorities to do in an emergency. Um, if that isn't the case, um, then rapidly you do get into the, into the world of the the unsafe assets of the post-war Hungarian Austrian currencies in the early 1920s. And uh, that's not a world in which you want to be. So, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's one instance where there are discussions that have been going on before the crisis that are really useful now in terms of uh, guiding our post-crisis response. And one of the interesting aspects, and it's obviously one, Marcus, that you you, you, you've been thinking about is uh, the, the question, uh, can you have a safe asset that's provided by a, uh, a network, an institutional system that is not a government? Um, and could that provide some of the stabilizing functions? So uh, you know, again, if you take the, 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 the question of uh, big providers of technology of information, uh, can they produce that kind of safe, safe asset. Um, that might be also a benefit for the future if that were a possibility. Um, so I'll, I'll just respond to uh, Marcus's uh, very good questions. Uh, uh, th those, are the, th those were the ones that were kind of within my, uh, my uh, sphere of knowledge. Um, uh, I, I agree, Marcus, that uh, the, the, you know, that um, financial repression is far less of a likely tool um, as long as capital mobility is, uh, is, is, uh, is truly free. Um, but again, inflationary finance is, is a possibility. Um, on, on the safe asset issue, uh, you know, uh, may, maybe I'm being a wet blanket here again, but you know the 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 concern I am starting you know that I'm starting to have is you know we, we have to recall that a, an asset safety is an endogenous uh, concept that really is in the eye of the beholder of the uh, investors in that asset and you know once we have um, these uh, safe assets being issued at the rates uh, you know at, at at percentages of GDPs that we haven't really seen. Uh, for a very long time. Um, the question is uh, whether the shift of what is perceived to be a safe asset or not could also change. I mean, the, the, the you know, UK bonds are, are safe assets at, uh, at you know, 80% of GDP, but are they safe assets at 200% of GDP? I, I mean, we, we, we will we will uh, we'll, we'll have to uh, see, but uh, you know, but uh, I, I together, uh, I'll, I'll second Harold's comment that, you know, you're, your work on, uh, you know, not only academic but also uh, policy on trying to promote uh, European-wide uh, safe assets would be a, a, a major contribution uh, to uh, to uh, you know to the uh, um, uh, to, to the uh, ability of uh, European governments to uh, cope with this crisis. I can help to follow up on Marcus's qu second question on. Uh the impact on human capital and the impact on, yeah. on physical capital. Harold, can you say something? Yes, I, 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 I mean, that's, that, that, that's uh, exactly, I think, the distinction between the, the, the plagues and uh, the, the wars, uh, that the wars involved a massive destruction of conventional physical capital. 
um, and uh, the plagues really were more devastating in terms of the human capital that they, they took away. And uh, the, the aftermath of the, of the plague is much more fundamental. Um, it, 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 it really is, is very, very uh, destructive, and particularly if it's regionally selective. So the regions that are badly affected um, suffer from a, a permanent uh, loss. Whereas uh, the destruction of, of physical capital is actually something that you know gives a chance for modernization. And so you, you know, if we think of um, you know, it goes back to the question that uh, that Ethan started in the discussion about whether uh, all these ventilators that are produced now are uh, going to be produced in enough numbers. Um, well, I mean, the question is not really producing large numbers of ventilators in the long run, uh, but it's a question of whether you get the skills in order to remake, uh, retool factories quickly. Um, and that's something that could could potentially uh, be, be, be a, a great stimulus. Uh, if, if I could just kind of uh, quickly make a comment because uh, you know the, the um, one one concern I have about the analogy with these uh, large pla large scale plagues is that our responses to the uh, to this uh, uh, pandemic um, have been quite different and as such the the loss in human life you know as, as tragic as it is is not going to be anywhere close to the scale of you know of, of you know no, no country is going to see more than one percent of its population uh, uh, die because of this but I, I think Marcus's point on human capital you know that that truly may be the capital you know it's not the the labor or the uh, physical capital that is being destroyed in this crisis but the human capital with uh, you know, many people not being able to uh, go to work and, and, and you know, develop those skills uh, or, or employ those skills. And, you know, I, I am a little concerned that a loss of human capital is, doesn't have an analogy to physical capital in that uh, that, that is more of a, a permanent uh, damage uh, and not one that recovers quickly after the crisis. Right. It's, it's, it's obviously going to have very different effects on different generations. And so the... Uh... You know, the, the, the students um, who are graduating at the moment uh, are obviously going to go into a very, very uncertain world, a very different world from the one that people graduate, who graduated 20 or 30 years ago into. And so that's, that's a question where, uh, where there's, a, there's a human capital um, which you know, is, it has enormous potential. Uh, but if the wrong kind of policy choices are taken may be wasted and that 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 that, that would be a terrible loss i'm very conscious of time here and unfortunately there are a lot of people who wanted to ask questions but there just won't be time to to uh, to have uh, any more questions so i want to thank you for uh, i think was the most illuminating and, and thought-provoking uh, discussion and and we very much hope that we can come back to you later in, you know, as we learn more from this crisis. I think it's, we are all in very steep learning curves, both about epidemiology and, and about the consequences for the economy and for the political system and for social matters as well. I, I don't want to summarize by any, uh, by any stretch, uh, but I, I think the, I took away, you know, one thing which I came back a number of times, of course, the, the role of government, how that changes in a crisis and, and we will have to see how that continues uh, beyond the crisis. And I think the, what this crisis, we will know, we, we, we know and, and we came out of Harold's presentation very well, you know, that this is a kind of crisis that's gonna take a long time to peter out because even when we are through the the worst part of the epidemiological cycle that will be, this will continue and, and and there will be a role for government throughout that process as well so so that that certainly is something that we we need to to watch and understand i think that was one thing that took away that was hopeful and i think uh, encouraging for for those of us who are trying to find international solutions global solutions that we should do that during the crisis or at least before the crisis is all over and when you are into this kind of phases where it's about uh, 
recrimination and, and, and blaming people or who, what was run wrong and so on. I think the, the, the fact that we now have an opportunity to maybe put in place some of the institutions and the mechanisms that we need to, to deal with this in the future, I think is, is encouraging. And we know from previous crises that, that there have been real institutional improvements and from those. So, so again, thank you very much for, for this. And I hope that uh, all of those who joined, there was a very large group of people from all around the world. And, and uh, it's very impressive that you all stayed with us for so long. So thank you very much and, and uh, be safe and be, stay healthy. Thank you.